Hey, thanks so much for joining us for our service today. It says in James that if we draw close to God, He'll draw close to us. And so today, let's open up our Bibles, let's prepare our hearts, and grab everything that He has for us today. Man, you, uh, I'm really excited about today. Um, we're calling this today Vision Sunday. And um, who's excited about Vision Sunday? Yeah, all right. Well, and so I don't know what you think Vision Sunday is, and I don't know what I think it is, but <laughs> I went before the Lord and I just said, all right, God, tell me, show me. And so he gave me a few things, and I, I'm going to try to sit down for this, because otherwise I start kicking and yelling, and, and then you all go, he's an angry elf. <laughs> you guys ever seen that? <laughs> Hi, he's an angry elf, and he's short like Z Zacchaeus, right? Um, <laughs> If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, I don't know if I'll be able to sit down because I, I might get too excited, but I'm just going to try it, okay? How's that? Somebody, is this odd? <sighs> um, see if we can get comfortable. I don't know what to do with my hands. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, God, we thank you for you for your presence here. God, we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're here with us. We're here for you. We're here for what you want to do. So, God, we just submit our lives to you. We surrender ourselves. We ask you to be here. And God, you would stir our hearts, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Vision Sunday. So I, I went before the Lord and I began to ask him and immediately he gave me three things. And so then I just began to meditate on those things and, and just search the, search the scripture and pray. And that's what I, I spent many days doing this week. And so I want you to just have, if, if you call this your home church, I just want you to be open to this. You might end with a lot of questions, and to be honest with you, I have lots of questions. My wife encouraged me. I said, I don't know. There's just, I just have so many questions. She said to me, hey, when God delivered the people out of Egypt, he didn't tell them everything he was going to do. He just told them a few steps. I thought, that was, that was wise. My, my wife's wise. And she said, he didn't tell them about Jericho. He didn't tell them about the giants. He didn't, you know, there was a lot, of, a lot of things that were coming before them. He just gave them the next thing. And then when the cloud lifted off the tent of meeting and the clouds started moving guess what it was time to move and so if we believe we're the church of God if we believe that God's here and working and moving and leading us then let's just trust when the cloud lifts and he says it's time to move let's move and um, he will be with us amen, amen. amen. you know a local church <clears throat> If it's supposed to be anything, it's supposed to feel like a family. It's supposed to be a family. You know, there's ministry centers, there's armies, there's worship centers. But if there's one thing that the church is supposed to be, it's a family. Let me just add this note, not a dysfunctional family. <laughs> because the net one name that God calls himself is Father, which means a father has a family. And so the local church is supposed to be a family. This church, you know, things don't happen on accident. Things happen for a reason. And this church has been here for 44 years this October. And many people have fought, cried, prayed, fought with each other. No, but um, <laughs> they've worked with the Lord to build something. And we need to honor that. And I have no intention of making big changes with this message necessarily. But let me just name a few things that I would describe our church as. We are Christ-focused. We're Bible-believing. We're spirit-led. Passionate worshipers. We care and love for others in a spirit of unity we build generational, we're presence-driven, and we're a local church that feels like a family. Mm -hmm. 
if there was one way I wanted to describe an atmosphere or an encounter with someone from this church, I would say the word life-giving. Now, that's a 2000s, that's an early 2000s word, but it has a, it's a comeback right now, all right? It's not a comeback. I'm giving it a comeback. Life-giving. Two things. People full of life and people who are generous with the life that God's put inside of them. People that are full of God's life and people who are generous with what God has given them. Life-giving. I want every encounter to be full of life. I want our, our atmosphere when people come, go, I don't know what it is, but I show up there, it doesn't take from me, it gives to me. Not, the only way that happens is because God shows up and he's the life giver. Amen. That's the only way it happens. Amen. And so kind of the question is, are we, are we giving God a place to come and work in our midst? Life giving. God, show up and give us life every Sunday. Every time we meet in our core groups. Amen. You know, um, before I get into the main part of my message, I just want to... You know, as I was studying, there was a couple situa moments as in the last two years that came to my mind. And I just wanted to bring that up. Um, I'm not going to say them specifically, but I felt like God pricked my heart and said, you know, confronted me on this. And so I just want to say that God's called me to this time. The Lord has appointed me here. I'm, I'm aware that I wouldn't be here if God didn't ask me to be here. And I wouldn't vote for me. Like, if we were voting, I wouldn't have voted for me. Okay, I would have voted for a lot of you, but I wouldn't have voted for me. But it so happens God asked me to do this. And so I know I'm appointed by him. And there's two things that I feel the Lord, and I, pa, talking to Pastor Steve, even starting, he said there's two things that a pastor does. A pastor is a shepherd. And the two things that a shepherd is supposed to do is lead and feed. And so today... This is, I hope you're fed by this, but, I, but mainly this is a leading sermon. This is a sermon that talks about where we're headed, what God's doing in our midst. And uh, as a shepherd, I don't expect you to call me pastor. I'm not saying call me your shepherd. That takes time. I'm all good with that. But let me just say this. I'm committed to feeding people who come to this building, to coming to this church, through whatever, whatever ministry, whatever services we have, I want you to be fed. And that only happens, of course, by God himself, but God uses people. And so, you know, in Ephesians 4.12, the Bible says that when each part does its special work, its special, uh, yeah, each part does its special work, the other parts are encouraged to grow. I don't know if you knew this, but if you don't do your part, other people won't grow. And so I'm committed to doing my part. It's not all about me. It's about him. But every part has to do their part. Otherwise, we get stagnant. So I want to encourage you today. Be part of the body. Here's what I heard God say right away to me. He said, I've called you to be a missional church. Return to the mission. What is a missional church? Right now, you might be going, we're going to go on a lot of missions trip. Well, we might do some of that. But I... I felt God say, return to the mission, refocus on the mission that I've given the church to do. If you don't know what the mission is, the mission is what we would refer to the Great Commission. And this church has done that, but I just felt strongly that God's saying, make sure you have the Great Commission or the mission that I've put on the church in focus. You know, um, I don't know if you, if you look at history, even the Jewish culture, the Jewish culture was a very insider, inside-focused uh, group. When Jesus showed up on the scene, it was very prejudiced against anybody who was not Jewish. Did you guys know that? Yeah. I'm sure you did. Even the early church still struggled with the fact that they, they kind of... They had this, the insiders and they had the outsiders. 
in business, in the business world. Can you imagine if you were creating technology and you just had a room full of nerds? Think about it. And they were creating technology for the everyday person. You know what happens eventually? All the start people keep talking and the circle gets smaller and smaller and all the products they create are for them. So then when they put it out into the world, guess what happens? Everyone's like, I don't even know how to use this technology. That was the beautiful thing about Apple. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Apple, it's like, it makes sense, finally. Who's ever felt that way? Oh, is that the devil's Apple? <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> um, but that's one thing that they did. They, they created a product that the consumer understood. It didn't, you didn't have to be a nerd to understand it. And I say nerd in the most loving way, by the way. Um, I love nerds. I love nerds because they get it and what I don't get. But that can happen in any organization in any church. You get inside focus. It begins to be created for the people that are at the core, or those that are in the inside. And God has called us to be a missional church. Let's turn to Matthew 28 and let's read. Matthew 28, verse 18. You have that up there? It says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus came to his disciples, one of the last meetings that he had, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. That's a powerful statement right there. Jesus is saying to his disciples, I have been given all authority on heaven and in heaven and on earth. Who has all authority in heaven and on earth? Jesus has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The devil does not have authority on earth. Would you disagree with me? It's, and then he says to his disciples, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Now, listen, I know I'm not saying, I'm not stating a new verse. Like, I didn't just find a, a verse you've never read. But the question isn't, have you heard it? The question is, have you ever done it? The question isn't, have you ever read this? Did you know about it? No, we probably all heard about it. Have you been in church any amount of time? But the question is, are we a part of what Jesus told us to do? Are we doing what he asked us to do before he left? A missional church. Let's, read, let's turn to Acts 1.8. I'm going to read from verse 1. In my first book, I told you, Theopolis, about everything Jesus began to teach until the day he was taken to heaven. After giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me just say that again. Jesus was giving instructions, but he was doing it through the Holy Spirit. Isn't that wild? But you're Jesus. He did it through the Holy Spirit. I found that interesting. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. He proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when the, whole, the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up in a cloud 
up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. <clears throat> now, the next thing that happens is the Holy Spirit shows up and the church of God is born in the earth. The Holy Spirit shows up on the scene and the church of God is born in the earth. Ta-da, here we are. Thank God for that moment. Thank God for that moment. We don't build the church. The Bible says that if God does not build the house, we labor. Those who labor, labor in vain. God builds his church. We build up the church. We encourage the church. We equip the saints. There's all kinds of things that we do, but God builds his church. This is a God thing. This is a God thing. What happens on that day is that Peter... The Holy Spirit gets a hold of Peter, and Peter goes, oh, this is a moment. Supernaturally, people come flocking, and Peter takes the moment to begin to preach, and it says 3,000 men were added. The belief is that 3,000 in all it could just be counted men, so that it could have been like 10,000 people added to the church in one day. 120 people 3,000 people get added to that group in one day, in one moment. The church of the living God started with a supernatural event that brought a supernatural harvest. I don't know how many times in their, their, their group of people. In one moment. Here's the first thing. God gave me three things. This is the first thing God said to me. He said, be a church that reaches out. He said the words reach out. Reaching out. You know, and I'm not talking about big adjustments. I'm talking about small adjustments that we can make. <clears throat> you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I call people every once in a while and I ask them, hey, what are you up to? You know what everybody says to me? Everybody says to me, I am so busy, I don't even know what to do with myself. My, full, my, my life is so busy and full, so full, I don't even know how to add another thing to my life. I mean, there's one person in my life I call and they say, I say, what are you doing? He goes, nothing. I go, you mean you're doing nothing, nothing. I have nothing going on. How is that even possible? Are you breathing? No. But one person, that's it. Does that person want to raise their hand and say, no, I'm just kidding. It's just so if, if you know, they can, people can call you and get you to do things. But there, there's no, like I ask people and I'm like, they're just like, I am so busy. My li I mean, we're running around everywhere. I'm so busy. I'm so who knows what I'm talking about? How are we all so busy? How is it even possible? So what I'm aware of is that when you look at the early church and 3,000 people added and the Bible says that they got together every day. They said daily they got together and worshipped. Daily they got together and heard the teaching. Daily they got together and ate, ate together. Can you imagine doing that daily? Nope. No one has time for that. <laughs> I don't have time for that. So I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that today. What I heard God say is he said this word margin. Marge? No, that's my sister. No, margin. Butter? We're going to start creating butter? Yes, because we all like toast. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We have a fitness center, we have a thrift store, and we're going to have a butter factory. <laughs> Margin. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You've heard the word of the Lord today. Margin. You know... Business, businesses that don't have a margin, guess what happens to them? Eventually they, they die. 
Margin, I don't know if, I, I, don't, I had to look this up, okay? I kind of understand the concept of margin, but I had to look this up. Margin is what you want so that you can pay all the things you have to do to create a business or to run a business. After your gross, pro, it's your gross profit, now you have, hopefully you have margin to pay all your employees, to pay everything, but what do you also need? You gotta have money to move forward. You gotta have some margin, otherwise your business stops and everyone, the, all the other businesses move forward and you go backwards. You gotta have margin in your, in your finances as a business so that you can move forward. What I heard God say is you got to create margin in your life for lost people, for prodigals, and for those who need a church family. We have to create margin a little bit. You don't need, you don't need a ton of margin. You need margin so that whatever God's doing, you have room for it in your life. You know, we are nesting right now. Who's ever been a part of a nesting moment? At our house, we're nesting. Oh, dear Lord Jesus. I got a prayer request today. <laughs> Nesting is this concept that we're preparing for a new person to arrive at the house. Nesting is, there, we're preparing. Somebody's coming. There's an excitement about nesting. And, and there's this new thing that's happened in the first world countries. Women know that nest, they're, they're, there's this hormone or something that kicks in. The man doesn't have it, but the woman does. She gets a whip and she gets a to-do list. That's what comes with the hormone of nesting, by the way. There's a whip that shows up, okay? And this big, long to-do list... And they get some stuff done when they're nesting. I kid you not. And the first world country is like, oh, I know I'm going to feel like that. I'm going to get that nesting hormone. And I'm going to get some, they, they know it's coming and they make it happen. It's impressive. It's impressive. But babies bring new life. There's an excitement to it. But let me just say this about it. Babies, although they're needy, although they need attention, the rest of the family still has to keep going. You still have other kids. You still have a job. You still have a home to take care of. You still have a marriage, which is a bigger priority, by the way. So you still have family dynamics that continue. But what do you do? You create margin in your life for the new arrival. And I heard God say, it's nesting season for this church. It's nesting season for this church. We have a building project going. And I know you're all being very impatient about it, right? <laughs> patient, I mean. I meant patient about it. So we're not suggesting, because I, I, I know when you start talking about, hey, we're going to reach out, and, and, and a lot of times we start going, oh, are they forgetting about me? Am I important? I know those thoughts can come to your mind. You know why I know that? Because my kids ask that all the time. The moment we heard, they heard we were pregnant, they said, are you going to have time for me? That was the first question out of a couple of their mouths. Will you have time for me? Let me, let me just tell you something. Acts 2.42 and down, it says that they were added to what? The church. They didn't take over the church. It didn't become all about them. No, they were added to the church. They were added to the church fellowship. They were added to the church worship. They were trained and discipled into what the church is supposed to be about. But you must create margin for new people. Why? Because they're valuable to God, just like you're valuable to God. Amen. They have gifts. They have callings. They're important to our creator. And we have to create margin for them. Now, if you're a new person in here, 
Welcome. You're at a, a family meeting today. <laughs> and when the church gets together and agrees on a few things, unity can create great momentum in our midst. When me and my wife agreed on the to-do list, finally, believe me, I fought it for a long time. But I would wake up and she would have, no, I'm just kidding, in the middle of the night. Be, okay, fine, I'll do it, I'll do it. Don't shoot. I'm just kidding. Matthew 9, it says, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great. But the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Who's in charge of the harvest? No, the devil's in charge of the world. The devil's in charge of the harvest. We can't get the harvest because the devil's in charge of them. Uh Uh-uh. Nope. Pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. We have the best marketing team in the world. You say, well, we got to get the net. We got to get the Facebook ads. We got to. We have the best marketing team in the world. I'm going to say it one more time. We have the best marketing team in the world. Pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. When Jesus showed up, he said, I'm going to make you fisher of men. He didn't say, I'm going to make you a fisher. I'm going to make you a person who crams bait down someone's throat. Right? He didn't say that. I'm going to give you a whip, honey, listen. I'm going to give you a whip, and you're going to just whip people until they come into the kingdom. No, he said, Fisher. He said, I'm going to show you how to put out the net. I'm going to show you how to put out the bait so people will want what you have. And here he's saying, pray to the person, to the God who's in charge of the harvest. The harvest is great and it's plentiful, but what's the problem? The workers are few. You know, I went to, me and my wife, we were early in our marriage, I went to a party with her and it was a crazy party. No, it actually wasn't. It was kind of tame. (laughs) And um, she was, she worked at a place and um, they invited everybody that, it was a Anyway, yeah. So they were all subs. They weren't like employees, but they said, hey, come on over to our house and we're going to have a party. And um, I don't remember a lot about it, but I remember one moment. And I'm going to tell you about that moment. I remember standing around awkwardly at this house and they were playing a football game. And so me and this other guy were playing, watching the game. And so we're sitting on the couch and I looked over at him. I said, hey, so what do you do? And he goes, He doesn't even look at me. He just keeps watching the game. He goes, I'm a pilot. I'm like, oh, okay. I was like, so who do you fly for? And he goes, you know, I really don't want to talk right now. He stood up and stood in front of the TV. And I'm stepped back there, and he stood up and walked up to the TV and just stood in front of the TV like this. Now, do you have any idea the awkwardness? It's not like there's 100 people. There's like... 20 people in the room, and me and him are sitting by each other on a couch, and he, I mean, if there's ever a shaft you give to somebody, that was the shaft. (laughs) You're not good enough for me. Why are you talking to me? You're annoying. Leave me alone. The game is more important than you. I remember just thinking, why am I here? I saw the door, and then I looked at my wife, and I was trying to decide, do I run for the door, or do I stay here to support my wife? My wife was the only reason I stayed there. I was praying. I was in my 20s. I was on staff here back in my 20s, and 
I don't remember all the details of what I was doing. I was working with youth, I think, and I was praying for lost, for the lost. I've always had a heart to see people come to know Jesus. When I think about people going to hell for eternity, I can barely control my emotions. I don't like to think about it a whole lot. So I was, but I was praying and I was just crying out to God, God, how do we reach people? See, reaching people for me is not like, I want them, I want them here because we want a large church or I want them here for my own pride. No, I want, them, I want them to know the creator. I want them to know their creator. I don't care if they come to our church. I just want them to know their creator. That's the cry of my heart. I don't even care if they come to church. I just want to know that for eternity, they'll spend it with their creator in heaven. And so I was praying. And I was just going, God, send us, you know, send us so that we could tell them about Jesus. Give us opening. I, that, I mean, that was just my prayer. And the Holy Spirit or God, whoever spoke, they're all the same, but they, he, someone spoke to me, okay? <laughs> I don't know why I'm getting hung up on that. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, uh, why would I send them to you? You're only going to offend them. You offend them when you ignore them. Now, you might think that's strange. And I don't remember if it was the youth group or whatever, but we have a pretty friendly church here. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Maybe? Okay. All right. We have a pretty friendly church, I think. But you know that did not come by accident? Wow, they're just friendly. That's, that just must be Minnesota. No, actually, you know what the typical thing is? I went to a church and everybody ignored me. Did you guys know that? I hear that all the time. I went to the church, I went to that church, and I got ignored. They literally scowled at me when I walked through the door. I hear that a lot. So this church is friendly. If it's friendly, the reason it's friendly is because somebody purposely created a friendly atmosphere. Why would God send us people if we're going to ignore them? If we have a church that's only for insiders, if we have a church that is only for our preferences, if we have a church that's just designed to make me happy, why would God send somebody? would just be offended. So I just want to say this, that if you call this place your home, if you say, this is my church, I want you to, to just encourage you, take ownership of your home then. Take ownership of your home. If you were inviting guests over and they walked to the front door and you ignored them, do you think they would ever come back again? If this is your home, take ownership and say hello to people who are new. Here's the greatest weapon every Christian has. Ask them, do you need me to pray for anything for you? Do you have any needs in your life that I can pray for? Simplest thing you can do, but it shows people that you care. Have you ever heard this statement? They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. No one, you're gonna, you can walk up to anybody in the street and just start telling them everything you know about the Bible. You know what they're going to say to you? Get away from me. You're crazy. But if you walk up to them and say, hey, I love you. God loves you. Don't say I love you. That's weird. Okay. <laughs> hey, God, God loves you. Can I pray for anything? Do you have any needs in your life that I can pray for? Not because, hey, can you, we, I need so many people to come to church. No, no. Do they have anything going on in their life that you can help them with? Is there anything that I can show you that, and, and pray with you so that God can show up in your midst and touch your life? That's one of the easiest things you can do for people in the world. I'll tell you that if, just like on the day of Pentecost. If God were to send the harvest and we were ready for the harvest. See, I, the question isn't, can God send the harvest? The question is, are we ready for the harvest? 
The question isn't, will the harvest come? Can it come? The question is, are we ready for the harvest if it showed up? If we ignore the harvest, the harvest is going to go, go away. It's going to leave us. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be like, well, they hate me. Why would I go there? There's no room for me there. No one's kind. No one's loving. The question is, are we ready for the harvest? And I'll tell you this, that if we would get ready for the harvest, this building will not contain the harvest. Why? Because God loves lost people. God has so many people. His eyes are on them. He cares about their situation. We have a, a serious epidemic of mental illness, depression. Let me just tell you a story. I ran into a lady. We were at a meeting down in Morris. And this girl who lives 10 miles from this church. And this is my understanding. Linda, just correct me if I'm wrong. In a three-month period, she lost three family members who took their life in three months. Mother, sister, uncle, boyfriend. And then she tried to take her own life a month before we had seen her. And to be honest with you, that's 10 miles from here, and I didn't hear nothing about any of those people. That's one person that's going through hell on earth, and they need someone to say, we care about you. No, we don't know everything. We can't figure out all your problems. But we know who God, who can step into your situation and can change your life, can heal you. The thing about prayer, prayer changes us more than it changes other people. Prayer changes us more than it changes other people. I, I heard a story of a young man, this is many years ago, but, and now he's the pastor of one of the largest churches in America. And he went to, he went to a college, he went to college, and is, you know, just like a typical college, he was unchurched, and he went there going, we're going to party it up. And so he started partying. After a few months of partying, he started to become discontent. He goes, I don't know, just, there's got to be something more to life. Someone walked up to him while he was walking to class and handed him a Bible. And, and he began to read his Bible, and he actually gave his heart to the Lord. And you know what the first thing he said to us? i got to find me a church to go to. So he went to the biggest, prettiest church in town that he could find. He didn't say what kind of church it was, but you can maybe imagine. He went to that church, and the bodyguard slash usher slash door greeter talked to him. And while he was talking to that person at the door, a young lady who was not dressed like a churchgoer came up, and he looked at her, and he said, Don't you know you got to dress better than that when you come to see God? And that girl turned around and ran away. And he goes, This is not the church for me. He went back to school, and one day at cafeteria, he saw some kids sitting around. They had Bibles, and they prayed for their food, and he goes, I'm going to go talk to them. He walked up to him and said, hey, I just gave my heart to Jesus, and uh, I'm looking for a church. I don't know what to do, really. And they said, they, they all celebrated. There's like eight of them. They all celebrated and go, man, that's awesome. They said, we have been praying for you. Wow. And their prayers not only, and then someone handing him a Bible, he got saved all on himself just reading a Bible. And their prayers caused the harvest to come. They didn't have to push. They didn't have to prod. They just had to pray to the Lord of the harvest. We have the greatest marketing team in the world. You don't have to worry about people getting saved, people coming we got to ask the question, are we ready, Destiny Church, for the harvest? Are we ready for the harvest? I was, I was at our house, I was at our house uh, yesterday, or no, last week. And I looked out at our garden, and I saw red tomatoes everywhere. There was almost more red than green on this tomato plant. 
And you know what I did? I got angry. Does that seem like a reasonable response? I got angry. And I was like, guys, the tomatoes are ready. <laughs> and there was a kid upstairs playing, and there was one on the couch reading a book, and my wife's over here, and I said, Ledger, will you help me get the harvest? And he said, no, I don't want to. <laughs> and then I looked at Henley, who was reading a book. Henley, will you help me get the harvest? And she said, no, I'm reading a book. <laughs> and I looked over at my wife, and I said, oh, you're already carrying the harvest. You hold on to that one. You're growing the harvest. That's enough. And I looked at Wells and Oakley, four and two, and I said, will you help me get the harvest? And they said, yes, Dad. <laughs> and I said, it'll have to do. <laughs> it'll have to do. More of it will make it in their mouth than in the pan, but it'll work. <laughs> and so we went out. And we started to pick the harvest. I remember Tom Stamen was here and he said, God told him, I don't remember the number, but God said, you weren't my first choice. <laughs> I've asked 24 or 27 other people before you. Do you hear that? 24 other people. And they all said no to me. Now I'm asking you, you're not my first choice, but will you help me get the harvest? You know, we live in a post-modern Christian world, most people would say. In other words, what does that mean? Gen Alpha coming up doesn't even know Bible verses. Some of them have never heard the name Jesus before. In America. That's Horrifying, but it's one of the greatest moments in church history. Why? Because the harvest is plentiful, and they, haven't, they don't have the walls of religion built this tall. Yeah, I, I have already heard it. This is what people say about the next generation coming up. They're so hungry for the power of God. They're so hungry for the real thing. You and me can't manufacture the power of God, by the way. But God loves the harvest, and God shows up when people are hungry for him. God shows up in power when babies are being born in his church. God loves it. He goes, oh, man, I'm going to show up, and I'm going to minister to them. I'm going to give them, I'm going to show them my power in my life. We have a great opportunity the first thing that God had said to me was pray. Create margin in your life and don't ignore the harvest when it comes. I have two other points and they are shorter, but we are, I, I've, gone, I've gone a while, I understand. Give me, give me a moment here, okay? The next part is discipleship. Because who knows, anybody with hormones can have a baby. That was supposed to be a little bit funnier than it was. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for clarifying, by the way. <laughs> I'll put it in every way. Any two people with the right parts can have a baby. And none of us are very impressed with that. It's like, yeah, yeah, you figured it out. Good, good for you. But who knows it takes parents to raise that child? Who knows it takes a family to raise kids? Anybody can have a kid and then bring them to an orphanage or something. But it takes people that are going to care for the person to raise that kid. And some say it takes a village. And I would agree with you that it doesn't just take one family. It takes a village because you want other people saying the same thing that you're, that you're saying. Amen? So I'm really excited. God has put on, this, put on my heart to also create a discipleship pathway. And I don't have a lot of, of stuff to share about that at the moment. 
Now, I, I want to clarify, because you've been in church any amount of time, you, you probably heard me say discipleship program. And I'm just going to say this to you. Programs are what we use to program a robot. I said discipleship pathway, which means Jesus always was moving. Jesus was walking. You know what discipleship takes the main ingredients in discipleship other than God, the Holy Spirit, you know, those things, it takes relationship. You cannot create disciples without, rela without relationship. Now, the word disciple is like the word apprentice. It's like if you teach someone to ride a bike, you, you, if you were taught a kid to ride a bike, your arm is on them, you kind of hold the steering wheel and you kind of walk them around for a while and then eventually you, you take your hand off the steering wheel and you keep pushing them. And then eventually you're kind of like just barely there just to catch them so they don't kill themselves, right? That's what discipleship looks like. It takes relationship. It takes hands-on approach. Let me ask you something. If you're here today and you're following Christ, how did you get here? Most people would say, somebody helped me. Somebody taught me the scripture. Somebody loved me. Someone showed me how to walk this thing out. I'm going to, I have two more things about that, and that is this. You do not reproduce what you want. I want you to think about that, that, that statement. You do not reproduce what you want. Most people would say, no, I can reproduce what I want. No, you can't. You only reproduce who you are. You reproduce who you are. You can tell your kids, don't do this, don't do that, but they're going to become whoever you are generally speaking. And so you pre reproduce who we are. So if we want wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ, my question to you is, are you a whole foul, wholehearted follower of Jesus Christ today? What one generation shows is optional, the next generation will show, will see, will see it as unnecessary. What you show is optional, another generation will say, that's unnecessary. So what are we showing the next generation? You know, we have almost 100 kids every week at our church in our different, our youth and our kids program here at church. Is that not baffling or what? You know what that means? Is that we have 100 opportunities to create whole, wholehearted followers of Jesus Christ. You know, we've always declared our church a generational church. In fact, we built a big building on the freeway, and it was a youth center. Because we're so committed to seeing the next generation know Jesus in this area. And that's not going to change. And because we have that focus, God has, I feel God has uh, given us a hundred kids every week that we can pour the life of God into. And here's the one word that God gave me about discipleship. Be intentional. Everybody say, be intentional. be intentional. You know, we spend more time with people than we think. But the question is, are you being intentional with the time that you're spending with them? The reason you know Jesus is because someone looked at you and said you're worth a little bit of effort and I'm going to be intentional with my time with you and I'm going to share what God's put in my life. Ministry happens in the overflow of our life. In, me, in other words, if you only have enough for you or you don't even have enough for you, you have nothing to give anybody else. Be intentional. Discipleship happens because someone was intentional with sharing with you. The last thing that I want to say that God spoke to me was he reminded me of the seven mountains. You guys know the seven mountains? Now, I don't get too excited about the seven mountains, to be honest with you. <laughs> but the idea here is that there's seven mountains in the world that's like healthcare, the church, business, entertainment, education, it goes on and on, right? Government. 
And I'll tell you this, that this church has been anointed for business. I know that because I've seen people come and two years later or a year later or moments later, they've started a business. I know that we're anointed for business. I know we've kind of, in a sense, conquered that mountain, not that there's not more to it. But I feel like in the future, God's calling us to be involved. And we started to knock on the door of government. I was down in a church in Costa Rica, and they were training up the next president of Costa Rica. They had enough faith and enough belief that, God, you want us to be involved in every level of government. You want us to be on level of every level of every mountain. And they're training up senators, presidents on every level, even on their local level. They're taking full intention to just have Christians everywhere. Isn't that amazing? They were training up young ladies to take over the design, to be designers, to take over the fashion industry. And they had one that was like basically the biggest fashion designer in Costa Rica. And she attended the church. She was on fire for God. She was in the front row. So what God can do with us is unending. It's just, it's amazing what God could do. We all have gifts. You have a part to play. And here's one of the biggest lies that the church has believed. That there's a secular world and there's a church world. There's a secular world and there's a spiritual world. And we just got to, you know, just deal with the, just pray for them, but they're all crazy. No, God's called us to take over every part of the world. And so I believe that God's calling us, those of you who are gifted, you are a full-time minister in this world. I am not just a full-time, you are a full-time minister wherever you go. You are salt and light, and you have a full-grown Jesus that lives inside of you. When you step into a building, Jesus himself stepped into that building. There's no such thing as a secular world. God made it all. It's all there to honor him. So God's called us to reach out. When you hear that term, reach out, I mean, I don't know if we'll change it or whatever, but in the coming months, I've, that's what God's put on my heart. We're going to start focusing on reaching out. In every part of our ministry, we need margin for reaching out. Pray. We have the best marketing team in the world. Pray for the loss, the harvest. Biggest thing is it gets us ready for the harvest. Nesting has already begun. Create margin in your life for new people. Create margin. If you're so busy playing and working, you don't have margin for anything else. Create margin in your life for what God's doing in our midst, in your life. Number, the easiest thing I can ask you to do when you come on a Sunday morning, be friendly. Be friendly. Who can be friendly in this church if you show up? Okay. Not all of you, but some of you. All right, I, that's fine. I understand. So if you can't be friendly, that's okay. But if you can be friendly, we do not want to ignore people that God is sending us. Maybe they're just looking for a church, or maybe they're already a believer, but they need to know they're welcome. If we invite people, you don't ignore them. Amen? When, when God talked to me about disciples, he said, be intentional with the time you already have with people. If you sit down with lunch for somebody, be intentional with the time. Yeah, weather's pretty nice out there, huh? That's not intentional. Hey, what's God doing in your life? What did you read in your Bible today? Hey, can we pray for anything today? That's intentional. Intentional is the time you have with your wife. You can go on 100 dates, but if you're not intentional with the time, guess what? You wasted your time. Be intentional. Baby, you are smoking hot tonight. I'm so glad I married you. You look more beautiful than the wedding day. That's intentional. Don't say that to other people, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. We're di I'm discipling you. No. Um, disciple your wives, husband, okay? Um, be intentional. You can spend 100 hours with somebody, but if you are not intentional with that time, you did nothing for them. In fact, you might have gone backwards. Be intentional with our time that we have with each other. If that's core groups, that's on a Sunday morning, show up ready to be a part, play your part. Amen? 
And the last thing is, wherever we go, you're in full-time ministry. There's no such thing as a secular world. The Holy Spirit's there. He wants to move through you. Every word you say is anointed by God if you, if you believe it. It can be the simplest thing. Man, it can be a word of encouragement. It can just be something that shows that you care. And that can do a lot for somebody. We have such hurting people out there that are hungry for a God that can intervene in their life. The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. And I pray that there's laborers in this house that would see those that are hurting and be a part of the solution in this world. Can everybody say amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me? We're just going to close. So I don't need the worship team today. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray over us and I'm going to dismiss you. Remember, you have, we have our kids in the back. Amazing bunch of kids and we love them. And we're going to have the prayer team come on forward. They'll be up here to pray with you if you have any needs. But God, we just thank you, Lord. Without you, we can do nothing. But God, with you, nothing is impossible for this church. God, you said you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. You said you'd give us the keys of the kingdom and whatever we loose on earth, heaven would loose onto earth. And whatever we bind on earth, heaven would bind with us. So God, we thank you today. God, we pray for the harvest to be loosed. God, we pray that our hearts would be prepared. God, I pray that a nesting spirit would come upon this church. And God, we would be ready for the lost people, for the prodigals. God, for those you're sending. And God, I pray that even the church that you called us to build in the future, we God, you would provide for us in everything we do in Jesus' name. God, we pray for laborers to be sent to the lost. God, we pray that you would break our hearts for those that are hurting. God, that you would give us the words to say in Jesus' name. If everybody agrees, say amen. 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 Thank you for coming today. God bless you. You're free to go.